right? These last two are not physical. These are totally like mental, emotional, kind of weird things. Mm, Maybe not weird, but just something that we deal with that isn't physical. But uh, so I want you to know that, again, you are not alone with mental and emotional. I don't know if we want to call it like negativity, but like negative thoughts or kind of outside things that make us not feel good. It's not abnormal. So even for a mom that like has never experienced any kind of like sadness, depression, like where you would say like it's some kind of clinical form of whatever, you can still experience that with all the hormones that happen during pregnancy. Getting pregnant and giving birth are two of the most exciting things you can ever hope to experience in this life. The moment you think you could be pregnant, you're frantically searching for all the best information, which is why you're here today. I'm Stephanie King, and with my many years of experience as a professional childbirth educator, doula, and lover of all things pregnancy, birth, and postpartum, I'm here to make preparing for your birth enjoyable, empowering, and totally easy. Each week, I'll cover different topics, interview professionals, and get into the nitty-gritty birth stories from mamas just like you. And when you're ready for more, you can join me in the My Essential Birth course at myessentialbirth.com, where I take you step-by-step through exactly how to prepare your mind, body, spirit, and partner for a birth you love. So let's get started. Welcome back to the podcast, guys. Let's start with that reviewer of the week. Um, If I haven't mentioned this before, I love reading these. I love that you guys take the time to offer these kind of testimonials or whatever you have to say up. Um, And it puts me in a good mood every time. So thank you. So this one is from Car Bar. And she says, amazing podcast. I am very thankful for this podcast. The content helped my husband and I feel confident and empowered about the birth of our first child. I ended up having a very quick labor and birthed our baby boy in the back of the truck on the way to the hospital into my husband's arms. We know the learnings from this podcast helped us feel calm and in control. I was able to have an amazing unmedicated birth and I recommend this podcast to anyone wanting to feel knowledgeable and relaxed about birth. Thank you so much and congratulations. What a story. And I'm sure that there are so many more details to that. That would just be awesome to hear. So Carbar, if you are listening, make sure that you send that story to hello at myessentialbirth.com. I'm like crazy curious about how that went. For those that are listening here, (laughs) um, I guess just a side note, the goal obviously is not necessarily to have your baby on the way to the birthplace, but I feel like I should put like a warning here that this might happen if you are totally empowered and you know how to work with your body and all of that kind of stuff. So warning here that you might have an incredible birth experience if you continue along with me. So let's get to it. This episode is all about kind of oddly enough, right? All these like pregnancy complaints that we know exist. And so we have reached out to the community. These are the things that we are hearing from you guys all the time. These are the Instagram messages and Facebook messages and emails that we get or within the birth group and all of that stuff. So these are the most common complaints that we are seeing. And I think they stay pretty constant over time. So take notes, keep track of this episode, save it for later so you can listen again and again, download this one because you are not alone and these things are totally common and I'm going to help you kind of through them. Like we're not just going to talk about what they are, but I want to talk about some of the solutions that we can use so that you can feel a little bit more comfortable as we go. With that, probably that first one that we see up here, nausea and vomiting, right? If you are a mom and you were in that first trimester, And I am so sorry if you were a mom and you were past that first trimester and you were experiencing this. Again, know that you are not alone. A lot of times it is considered or called morning sickness, quote unquote, right? But if you have been pregnant and you've experienced it, you know it can happen at any time. Yes, it might be in the morning. It's likely it's like all through the day and into the night and all that kind of stuff too. Doesn't mean that you will vomit, but you definitely can have nausea. I know that was the case for me all the way through into like right about when I hit that 12 to 14 week period. Um, I felt like I was just sick all day long and then it kind of let go out of nowhere and everything was fine. I consider myself lucky that way because I know many women that is not the case and it can go really, really um it can go a little bit deeper and a little bit longer. But about 70% of women experience this morning sickness. And as I said, some have it the whole time, which seems pretty unfair, but it's primarily caused from levels of HCG or that 
hormone that tells us if you are pregnant or not. Like if you go have a pregnancy test, they test your HCG, right? Um, and that that HCG, how it like doubles every day and you hear that in the beginning. So that's how like it, when you pee on a stick and it shows or they do blood work and they're like, that's what they're looking for, that like doubling that's happening. It peaks around 12 to 16 weeks, which is why that morning sickness subsides around that time. Now, it's caused by estrogen and progesterone. There's a lot of like other stuff that happens here, but increased saliva, you can have sensitivity to smells. There's a lot of things that can bring it on. Um, even somebody talking about certain smells or foods, you don't even have to smell it or see it. <laughs> um, just hearing about it can can bring it on, pictures of it, whatever. Um, but I mean, having an empty stomach, right? So that's why a lot of times you'll hear like, oh, just have a little bit of saltines or something, put something in your stomach in the beginning of the day. I'm going to tell you to be careful with that because when we start on carbs and all that stuff, those sugars can actually make us feel more sick and things like that. But um, you can have a metallic taste in your mouth, like certain medications can cause it like antidepressants. So what can we do? This is where we get into the like, yes, eat small, frequent meals. And if you are someone that has the nausea and you're getting all of that information, all these great suggestions from all of your awesome people around you um, and your sweet mom, right? It's okay to take it with stride, take it in stride, smile, say thank you, and move along because you know what is working and what is not working. Um, but there are acupressure points that are on your wrists that you can, they have like seek sick bands. So you can order, um, even on Amazon, just get seek sick bands and you can try some acupressure points, um, small frequent meals. And I would say, keep the protein high, the higher, the better, lots and lots of protein, um, that can totally help. And that's hard when you're not feeling well, but interestingly enough, as you eat more protein, you should feel less sick. So it's kind of one of those catch 22s where you're like, but I'm so sick. I feel like I can't eat any protein, but then you have some protein and you feel better. So eat the protein. Um, anything peppermint may or may not help. So that can be like peppermint essential oil or a peppermint tea, um, smelling peppermint, any of that may or may not help alleviate some of it. You can even rub some of that on your stomach for nausea. If you have like, um, a peppermint essential oil that can really help. Um, B6 and Unisom is often recommended by providers. There are obviously benefits and risks to, especially when we're talking about Unisom or medications like that. Um, but if you're getting um, any of your vitamins and stuff and you're doing it by food, that's obviously going to be your best bet. So remember those like high protein, good healthy meats, that kind of thing is probably your best. A lot of times women will use um, acupuncture or acupressure, like I had said, kind of the seasick bands. But acupuncture is a whole other era of thing that you can look into as well. Ginger, ginger, that is a good one. If you can do fresh ginger, there's ginger candies. I always found that any of the candy stuff, if it had sugar in it, it actually did not help. Even if I liked sucking on it during the time, like it actually did make me feel sicker. So again, totally whatever you, you want to do. Um, and then there's other things in the way of medications and stuff. And if you're one of those moms that's having a really hard time where you can't keep anything down, you're not able to stay hydrated, maybe you're having to go to um, either the emergency room or your doctor's office or something like that because you need IV fluids and things, that is a separate. <laughs> We're not going to say go eat some crackers and have a high protein meal and you're going to be fine. Make sure that you're working with your provider. Um, but maybe you guys have heard of HG or that hypermesis gravidarum, and I'm probably saying that wrong. That is like a whole separate issue. So if you find that you're dehydrated and losing weight and all that kind of stuff, you, headaches, you're not functioning normally, anything like that, make sure that you reach out to your provider. Okay. And then let's cross our fingers that 12 to 16 weeks, you will be feeling better. But Hopefully you can try some of those things and hopefully it does help alleviate some of your issues. Next, heartburn and acid reflux. Now, this can start really early or it can come on as that belly gets bigger and it kind of pushes all of your organs and stomach and all of that stuff a little bit higher or into different places. So uh, really common heartburn and acid reflux, very common, unfortunately. Actually, about 50% of women will experience this throughout their pregnancy, so be aware. Again, it is caused by those same hor hormones of relaxin and progesterone. But basically the valve between your esophagus and your stomach that allows food to go through and normally would cut off into the stomach, um, that relaxin, it relaxes that 
that kind of valve. And so it allows it to be a little bit more open. And then with the space being a little bit higher, your stomach and everything being a little bit higher, that acid can just come up a little bit easier. And so this is actually one of those things. If you are experiencing heartburn or acid reflux, this is um, when we've got our three free exercises that I'm telling you guys to do every single day. And I will put the link in the show notes if you don't know what that is. But those three exercises and that we have one of them, which is the forward leaning inversion. This is a situation where we say, don't do it. (laughs) Um, You can try if it is totally miserable though, or you're getting tons of, because there are different, right? Acid reflux is, can be a little bit crazier for some moms and really mellow for others, even though it still exists. But this is one of those times that we say, if you're feeling it when you're going upside down, don't do it. It's not worth it. So just, it can just be a little bit tricky for you as you're working through pregnancy. Um, Big meals can especially cause it anything that you can think of, like that, like just in your thinking of what could irritate this, it would be like, you know, spicy foods, uh, really big meals. It can even be like baby getting bigger and just putting pressure on that area or moving, moving around while you're eating. That can kind of be funky. Uh, and then along with that relax and like releasing or relaxing that valve, your body can be digesting things a little bit slower, moving food slower. So make sure that you're chewing your food really well, that you're drinking lots of water with your meals and in between. And hopefully some of that will help alleviate things. It can also help to make sure that you're sitting up after you have a meal. So like sitting up, even leaning back a little bit at a 45, if you need to like rest after eating. Um, We actually say if you can like take a walk after you're done eating, that can actually be really nice. And then when you come back, if you sit, then make sure that you're kind of propped up just like you would do like with a newborn. (laughs) Maybe if you don't have a newborn yet, you don't know, but they have the same issue where sometimes that esophagus, that valve, it just doesn't close off all the way. And like every time they eat, they throw up. And we definitely had this with my third baby. And it was like, okay, put them in the bouncer, prop them up, put all the burp clots around them and let's go to town. So same thing with mom, prop yourself up. 45 degree angle, relax, try and breathe. Um, and hopefully that can be a little bit helpful. If you notice that it's like, you know, happening a lot, you're having a lot of burping or maybe you, it's really like burning your throat or you're having other issues then make sure that you seek help and, and reach out to your provider as well. Actually, all of these things you should really be checking in with and talking to your provider about, but if you're noticing things in between seeing them reach out. Tiredness and exhaustion. (laughs) Tell me how many of you are experiencing this right now. It is so common. And I can't even tell you, like every single time, like my body knew I was pregnant. And I mean, from the time, I don't know what it was, but the second that I saw those lines where it was like, yep, you're pregnant, I was like, oh my gosh, you guys, I'm so tired. Oh my gosh, you guys, I'm so nauseous. (laughs) And it was just like, it kicked in. It's like, as soon as my brain knew, my body was like, okay, here we go. And that tiredness and exhaustion, it especially happens in that first trimester and then especially in that third trimester. So hopefully some of you guys get that second trimester like wind where you're like, oh my gosh, I feel so good and I have all this energy and I feel happy being pregnant and I look good being pregnant and I'm able to move around and all that kind of stuff. Um, Like I said, most common first and third trimester, but some women are going to experience it the whole time it's because you're growing a baby. (laughs) There's really not much else to it. You are doing all of the work to grow a baby. And I mean, you are producing extra blood. You, um, I mean, think of everything that is happening inside of your body. Like your body is hard at work doing all of this, this hard work to grow this baby. And, um, so obviously that can, it's all part of it. Things that can help though, is eating really good foods, high amount of protein. Make sure you're getting that red meat and that iron, all that good kind of stuff. Um, you can exercise regularly. Like again, if you can be at, at least at a minimum, like walking a couple of times a day, especially after your meals, that can be really helpful. Limit caffeine, nap when you can. Those kinds of things can be really helpful in the way of um, eliminating any extra exhaustion. Like we're going to have whatever is coming at us anyways because our body's doing the hard work. But if we can get rid of the extra things that are causing some of that extra exhaustion, then then that's what we want to do. And along with those iron-rich foods, remember that we highly recommend, and if this sounds good to you, if you can handle it, right, beef liver is so good for moms. And so I'll put a link. We've got a coupon code and everything for you guys so that if you're looking for a really good beef liver supplement, we have one. 
Um, and I'll put a link for that in the show notes this week as well. Now, if for some reason you're experiencing like pains or shortness of breath or dizziness or other things that go along with this kind of like I'm tired, if it seems like it's a little bit more than just I'm growing a baby tired, again, good time to reach out to that provider, right? Let's talk about pelvic pain and SPD. This comes up a lot. Now, SPD, it stands for symphysis pubic dysfunction, or it can be PGP, which is pelvic girdle pain. But 20 to 25% of women, or in other words, about one in five, one in four women, are going to experience some kind of pelvic pain during pregnancy. And I know that doesn't sound very exciting. So remember, you've got that relax and it just, it, it lets everything be open and all of that. And so when that happens and you're growing your baby and you've got that extra weight and you're moving around, it's really normal for those things to kind of get overstretched and stuff. So again, if you, you guys have those three exercises, like if you are doing your pelvic tilts, this is something that can help alleviate some of that pain. Um, so make sure that you, if you can, right, when you get up in the morning, get out of bed, do like 30, 40 pelvic tilts. Same thing for when you go to bed. Um, I also recommend anytime during the day when you're just like, I have a free moment, do some of those, those um, pelvic tilts. It can really help alleviate some pain. Honestly, there's like, I feel like a lot of things can cause it. It can be as simple as rolling over in bed if things are misaligned or whatever. Um, lifting one leg, you could be exercising, getting in and out of the car, everyday things. Anyways, it just kind of makes it a little bit trickier. So like all these like normal everyday things, when you're experiencing this kind of pain, it becomes this like shooting, uncomfortable, like really unhappy, feels like things are grinding down their pain. So uh, we can also reach out to a pelvic floor therapist. So again, for let's let's dive into the solutions. One of the things that you can do if you have access to a pelvic floor therapist, we highly recommend doing that. Um, definitely be careful when you're lifting things. Like we say, no heavy lifting. That whole pel pelvic area is already dealing with a lot of like pressure and extra weight and stuff down there. And so when we add that lift, and we're engaging muscles and all of that even. Um, we can't help but like really be pushing that area. So no heavy lifting. Not that you can't do some like basic weight training and stuff like that. But just just be gentle. Um, we always say like move your legs together. Move them as a unit. So when you go to get out of bed, don't just swing one leg over. <laughs> if you're like me, that is totally what I do. Um, try to move your legs together. The, the motion like your legs and hips should be moving together. Pillows between your knees when you sleep, that can really help alleviate some of that pain. And then if you haven't um, used one of these before, you can grab like a pregnancy belt and really it just like wraps around your back and underneath your stomach, gives it kind of a hug and pulls it up just a little bit. So just a little le less pressure on that pelvic area again. So that that's, those are all good things. If you are finding that like you are, are stuck, you, you know, you're not functioning well, you can't walk, it feels like it's grinding that's when it's like, please see a pelvic floor therapist. Um, and really you should like way before that happens, <laughs> if you are concerned at all. I mean, it's great if you have access to it and you can use it all throughout pregnancy, see a pelvic floor therapist. Um, but if not, and you're noticing some issues, like definitely get it before it's like, oh my gosh, I'm in severe pain. We don't want to do that. Now hip pain, this kind of goes together, like that whole area, right? hip pain can be really, really common. And again, growing a baby, your uterus is expanding, that whole area is expanding and you've got that relaxing again. Um, and it's really common to have hip pain. Not great, but common. Um, it probably has to do with some weight gain. It has to do with that relaxing again, posture and position where however you're sitting. Um, if you can be out of chairs, if you can really like be on a birth ball or something that's forcing you to kind of engage your abdominal muscles to stay up instead of like leaning back, sitting on your tailbone, that kind of thing. And especially for like long hours at a time. So if you like work at a computer or you're at home and you're watching TV and you're just kind of like in this seated position, it can be a little bit more stressful on those hips. So keep that in mind. But same thing, um, like when you're sleeping in bed and stuff, pillow between the legs. And you guys, when I'm saying pillow between the legs, I don't just mean like one. I mean until your hips are even height. Like if you are laying on your side um, and you're and you put a pillow between your leg and your top leg still dips down, then that's not enough pillow. You need to put enough pillows that your legs are parallel <laughs> and um, your hips are are also parallel, like they're in line. 
So there should be nothing like dragging or or pushing from the top. So keep that in mind. A peanut ball could be a really, mm, I don't know that you would sleep with it, but a comfortable option if you're like watching TV and laying on your side or something like that, or just at night when you're reading or whatever, whatever you're doing at night. Again, with the pelvic tilts. So if you I'm, I'll just make sure you guys all have access to the three free exercises, but the pelvic tilts can be really, really com- comfortable. And actually with that, the forward leaning inversion as well, that can also help for hip stuff. Squatting is also a good one. I guess that's all three of them. So just do all the exercises and then chiropractic care. I haven't talked about this yet, but really I am telling you from experience, I waited too long to get chiropractic care with my first, I think, and I only ended up having it like once or twice. With my second, I was way more proactive. And with my third, it was like, this is not, it's a non-negotiable. We just have to do this. And the difference was big. Um, And especially I think your body when you're having babies and you hit that, like you're pregnant again, your body's like, oh, we're pregnant. (laughs) You know, let's do all the things that, (laughs) that are uncomfortable and not fun. So just if you can get with a chiropractor and you can do it early, that would be good. Make sure that it's somebody trained in pregnancy. And I would even be with somebody who is familiar with or um, certified in the Webster's technique and that they have a really high rate of seeing women who have breech babies and they utilize that technique and that technique is successful for them. High rate of babies that turn. Do all of that homework and then go after the chiropractor. No, I don't suspect that you're going to have a breech baby, but if you do, now you don't have to go finding another chiropractor. So highly recommend that. Yoga and stretching can be really, really great. And then again, belly binding. So whether or not you're using one of these like Velcro things that we have online or the Bangkok binds um, where you bind it yourself and you would just do it up just a little bit, any of that will work. If you have a robozo or a sheet and you wrap it around and pull your belly up and just like make a few knots, that can work too. So whatever, whatever works for you is good. Just have your husband stand behind you and hold your belly. It's great. Just that'll, that'll solve all the problems. Um, again, if you're having any sharp shooting pains or anything that seems out of whack, like to an extreme kind of thing, make sure that you're reaching out to your provider. Uh, let's talk about ligament pain. This is all the same area. Hip pain is different than ligament pain. Ligament pain is really, really common. Like you'll hear moms say, um, I just, it feels like this like sharp shooting pain, like right and left side of my pelvis, like kind of like where your hip bends and, or where your legs, like you put, put your leg up and there's a crease. You can put your hand in that crease. That is, um, really, really common for moms. And again, we've got all that relaxing and all that good stuff. So what happens is, and you'll see this, especially when like moms go from sitting to standing really quick, they'll stand up and they'll be like, Ooh, you know, like felt that one. Um, that is your round ligament pain. It's super common. It is like, there's nothing bad going on there, anything like that. It's just that things are a little bit more sensitive. So, um, and it's, it's funny because as you become more pregnant, <laughs> it is not just the like, oh, cause I stood up. Oh, it's cause I coughed or I sneezed or I was laughing too hard. And it's like, ah, you know, busting I got kind of thing. So totally normal. Stick with your three exercises. Um, definitely, definitely part of it. Pelvic tilts are like a huge one for ligament pain. Like that was something that, um, really, really helped to alleviate mine. So highly recommend. And the more you can get the pelvic tilts in, the more of them that you do, the better that area is going to be because it is such a simple, gentle motion that you're doing, but it is also strengthening. Um, it's strengthening some muscles very gently in that area that help that to, that help to carry your baby and strengthen that just, uh, just enough to where it does alleviate that pain. So think of that. Again, maternity belt or a belly bind um, baths can be really great. Um, Adding some Epsom salt to your baths. Again, really, really great. Focus on posture. Same thing with like sitting and things. Um, Slow movements. Like I said, if you go sitting to standing really quick or laying down to sitting up or I guess laying down to sitting up to standing real quick, uh, all of that can kind of cause some of those issues. So be a little bit more slow and gentle with your body. Easier said than done, right? Um, and then swimming can feel really great. So for all of this, like hip pain and all that kind of stuff, swimming can feel really, really great. If you're able to get into the, into the bath, um, or a pool where it's like big enough to get some, alleviate some pressure, you guys, I've like never been pregnant in an area or during a time of year where I could get into a pool and I'm talking to you guys in the summer. How are we like halfway through the year, by the way? But anyways, talking to you guys in the summer, like if you have access to a pool, 
go any kind of big body of water you know whatever lake you're swimming in or beach or pool go do it (laughs) you will be so glad that you did um again along with this if you're having like other things like if you think oh i can't tell if it's ligament pain and you're having like burning with urination um or abdominal cramping um, anything that feels like you're like having that pain and it's coming along with a stomach tightening anything like that spotting make sure that you check in with your provider now since we are in summer let's talk about and and because you're pregnant let's talk about the swelling because swelling whether or not it is summer is definitely something that happens to pregnant women totally common. Um, there are some things that you need to look out for, but especially in the summer, um, when it is hot outside, it, swelling is even more common. So this is a big one, like 80% plus women experience some kind of swelling. So remember you have like another 50% of blood that you've created and bodily fluids and all that kind of stuff. We've got weight gain, there's gravity involved, hot weather, um, being on your feet a lot during the day. So like you know, you'll probably notice like, oh my gosh, I'm swelling at night, time to put my feet up, that kind of stuff. And then obviously there can be the like scary, maybe it's a sign of preeclampsia, which it is not always. So don't be scared if you are experiencing some swelling. Um, but it, that would usually be, um, it would come along with like high blood pressure, or headaches or pitting, um, like pitting in your, in your hands or feet. So like if your feet are swollen and you stick your finger in there, um, stick your finger in there. If you poke (laughs) like your foot, you like push your, you know, with your finger, your foot down um, and the skin doesn't pop back up right away, but it kind of like stays pitted. That can be a sign of edema or water retention. And that could be a sign of preeclampsia. So there are some things to look out for, but some things that you can do. So Epsom salt baths again, and maybe not too hot, maybe, you know, nice, even like a cool bath could be really great. But with that Epsom salt, make sure that you're having the right amount of salt. So salt your food to taste. Um, it's so interesting because we still have providers that say like low sodium diet for moms that are experiencing swelling. And it has been proven time again, time again, that that is not the case. So salt your food to taste. Um, but you do want to avoid um, high fat, greasy, deep fried, that kind of stuff. So normal table salt on normal food, preferably like meat and veggies, right? If we're being really good about what we're eating. Um, and then trying to avoid all of the like processed, deep fried, that kind of thing. Lots of water and especially in the summer. So, and salt and water, right? Um, but lots and lots of water. It's easy to get dehydrated, especially in the summer. Um, so make sure that you're drinking lots of water put your feet up, make sure that you get that massage every night. I mean, if you're swelling, it's like, sweetie, this is, it's like, it's not just because I want it. Like we need to, we need to do this massage. So make sure that you bring that up. Exercise and yoga can be a really good thing. Um, Walking, even though it like feels like, oh, I'm swelling more when I walk, it actually will help with swelling later. So even if you come back and you're like feeling a little bit more swollen, it should help alleviate and some, you know, lymphatic drainage kind of stuff, just get rid of some of that. And if you're drinking the right amount of water and peeing regularly, it will help grab all those toxins and and push that out too. But move around. You shouldn't be sitting all day. Um, I know that's easier said than done, especially if you're like at a desk job or something like that, but take the time, you know, every hour set a timer and, and take a couple of minutes, do pelvic tilts, get up, walk, whatever you need to do so that you can kind of alleviate some of that pressure on your body. You were growing a baby and it deserves a little bit more attention that way. And it is okay. I'm giving you permission to do that. So make sure that you do that. Loose clothing can also be helpful. Now, again, I kind of talked about it, but if you're, if you have excessive swelling or you've got, you know, these headaches or you're seeing spots or um, anything like that, or, or that like edema where it's having the pitting or you have really rapid weight gain, time to see your provider. Okay. Another complaint sciatica and back pain. This is really common. 50 to 80% again of women are having some kind of back pain during pregnancy. Um, Sciatica is really common. And and just as your body grows and your baby is pushing against all of these things back here, it can hit that nerve. It's the sciatic nerve and it can cause pain that shoots from your lower back down through your leg on, on the right side or the left side on one side or the other. So I have, if you are in the birth course, there's an entire, if you go to the resource section, there's a whole thing on sciatica um, and there's videos and it shows you how to do all the stretches and stuff like that. So there are some, 
some stretches and things that you can do to alleviate that pain. It's not perfect. It won't, it's not that it necessarily is going to make it go away all, all at once or at all, um, but it should help alleviate some of those things. Remember, it can be caused by that weight gain, um, your posture, poor sleeping positions, lack of strength. I mean, it can be caused by all kinds of things, but really you're growing a baby and it's just a little tricky. Again, those three exercises, that's what you're looking for. The pelvic tilts, um, alleviating, if you can do that forward leaning inversion and alleviate some of that pressure that it's putting down low, um, and even squatting and putting your back into a really nice aligned position, all of those things can help that sciatica. If you are sitting on a birth ball, that can be helpful. Um, rebozo sifting. And if you haven't heard of that, um, again, we have videos in the course, but rebozo sifting, whether or not you're using like a sheet or a rebozo, which is just, um, a cloth that is woven in a very specific way to, to deal with moms during pregnancy and labor, but you put this sheet or this cloth over the belly while you're on hands and knees and somebody stands over you holding the sheet, lifting your belly and kind of sifting, we call it sifting the apples, but that can help alleviate some of that extra pain on the back area. Um, also I would say, you know, you can use a right sock or a heating pad or make sure that you're getting that massage. Chiropractor is like big time. I, I absolutely needed the chiropractor for my sciatic pain during pregnancy. It was no fun. But when I went to the chiropractor and I did sciatica stretches, it was totally manageable. So I want to encourage you that that can totally be the case as well. All right. These last two are not physical. These are totally like mental, emotional, kind of weird things. Mm, maybe not weird, but just something that we deal with that isn't physical. But uh, so I want you to know that, again, you are not alone with mental and emotional. I don't know if we want to call it like negativity, but like negative thoughts or kind of outside things that make us not feel good. It's not abnormal. So even for a mom that like has never experienced any kind of like sadness, depression, like where you would say like it's some kind of clinical form of whatever, you can still experience that with all the hormones that happen during pregnancy. Again, and I've shared about this before. And as I say it, it makes me feel bad. But I, I remember growing up and thinking, you know, depression isn't real. Like, what are these guys? What are these people talking about? Like, it's such not like such a joke, but I it just was really hard for me to take anybody seriously when I would hear that, you know, they're suffering from this or suffering from that. If you've never experienced it, you like you have nothing to relate to. You're like, OK, like I, I get what you're saying. I'm like, I feel sad too. So like, go take a walk or, you know, <laughs> you don't understand. You just can't, you can't understand. You cannot process it. That was me. And then I got pregnant and I had prenatal depression. I was experiencing all kinds of feel. I like had this heavy, dark cloud that was hanging over me. And I felt like just the world was sad and dark and I like, I couldn't get out of it. And I remember calling my provider and I was like, Hey, I'm experiencing this and this. And like, I do not normally feel this way. I don't have depression. I don't like, this is not me. I'm like crying every day. Like something is wrong. And they're like, well, do you feel like harming yourself? And I'm like, no. And they're like, well, there's not much we can do unless you want some medication. And I'm like, wow, that was extremely unhelpful. I didn't say that to them, but I was like, okay, thank you. They kind of just blew it off as like, yeah, that can happen. Um, and <laughs> I don't know, maybe that wasn't like a bad, maybe that wasn't a bad thing to hear from them that like, yes, it's like somewhat normal to an extent. Um, but I, being in a place where I hadn't experienced that before, um, it can be a little bit tricky. So I think when we're talking about like, oh, 20% of women experience this, I definitely think it is more. It's just how many pe people actually say something and, and how is that tracked? Um, but I think for myself, I, kn I know it was like the hormones for sure. <laughs> I had not experienced that wave of hormones um, like that. And then, I mean, in our case, right, we were newly married and marriage and I was working and maybe it's just the stress of things. You got to kind of look at like your life situation and all that. But I think some of it is just the, the physical weight of like carrying a baby and being tired and working through your day. And then there's like the mental load of things where even if you don't realize you're thinking about it, it's probably like, what kind of mother am I going to be? And do I have everything I need for the baby? And, um, you know, am I prepared to do this hard thing called motherhood? And and how are my husband and I going to raise this baby? And whatever, it, whatever's going on in your mind. But I think it, it's really common 
And it can come along with some mood disorders or, or whatever, especially if it's something that you've experienced before. Like it'll be like, you know, you'll know exactly where you're at. If you haven't experienced before, just know that it can happen. Um, and it can it can be helpful to know like, oh, do I have a family history of this kind of stuff? Did my sister go through this? My mom go through this or whatever and, and have that conversation with your family. I don't know that I had any of those conversations until I was experiencing it and then brought it up. And then it was like, oh, yeah, I, I went through this too or whatever. So. Um, so it can be helpful. Maybe you're not experiencing it yet, but it's a good question to ask your like mom and siblings if you have other people that have been pregnant before you, aunts, whatever. Um, so that you can you can be prepared for it in case that is the thing. So solutions for this one. Make sure that you are reaching out to the right people. Um, in my case, my provider, it was good for them to know. I still think that was like a positive that I reached out to them not helpful. <laughs> there was nothing that they did that was helpful for me. Um, and I wasn't interested in being on medication. I didn't feel like that's what I needed. It could have been maybe some talk therapy could be helpful. It could have been helpful for me. It, it can definitely be helpful for you. Um, I do, it is really important that you're reaching out to the right people. So if someone that can help you is going to say the, the right things, is going to hear you, is going to affirm what you're feeling. So um, in my case, I had my husband. And so I think I kind of scared him with with how I was dealing with it or what was happening to me. Cause he was like, Oh shoot, we didn't, ah, I'm not prepared for this. I don't know what to do with this. Um, but he was really proactive. So when you tell somebody that loves and care about you, they might not have all the answers, but they can help you get to where you need to go. So, um, something that is really, really important. So this is what I tell my moms, whether or not you are pregnant or postpartum, but this is, if, you should be getting outside at least 20 minutes a day. And I mean, outside in the sun, walk, move your body while you are doing it. There is um, there is so much good that comes from being outside in the sun, breathing fresh air. Don't be looking at your phone. Look around at the world ar around you. Don't wear sunglasses. Like get the light. Um, all of that as you are moving your body. That they can, It's just really, really positive. Make sure that you're drinking lots of water. Make sure that you are eating healthy. Like check yourself. Did I have a good amount of protein today? Um, am I eating and drinking good things? Am I putting good things into my body and am I moving my body? Those endorphins that get flowing with like moving your body. It's really, really important that we do that. Um, I definitely leaned on prayer. And, um, and, and in our case, my husband was able to give me a, what's called a priesthood blessing. And it, that was really helpful for me. And in fact, I had what's called a healing blessing. So I needed two priesthood to come and do that. Um, and it was, it didn't solve it by any means, but it did help. And so anything that I think anything that you can do that's going to bring you a little bit of peace or help you kind of get through it, that that is what you should be doing. Um, positive affirmations. You guys know I talk about these all the time. So anything that, that we're afraid of or, um, you know, is bringing a sadness or fear or whatever, turning those into two positives and then saying them out loud over and over and over. And I also what helped me were scents. So at the time, you know, anyways, my husband took me to Target and he was like, what smells good? <laughs> and I think at the time it was like um, fall. So they were like pumpkin spice candles or this or that or whatever. And um, and I like I was smelling things and I'm like, this smells so good. And he's like, let's get it. And he had read that like scents and all that kind of stuff that can help too. Um, knowing what I know today, maybe I wouldn't have picked a scented candle from Target. However, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And if it smells good, it smells good. And if it makes you feel good, great. Um, but knowing about like essential oils and how those can can affect the body and for the positive, I would probably lean more towards that. I would try that first. But I'm still just a sucker for good sense and it doesn't matter where it comes from. And yes, I will burn a candle. So um, so yeah, that I, I think all of those things can be really, really helpful. Now, if you're experiencing obviously – where you're having some extremes on on one side or the other, you're experiencing um, thoughts of harming yourself or others or things like that, then then obviously like, yes, reach out to like a crisis line or something like that. Maybe not even your provider, like really like reach out to somebody who can get you immediate help and make sure that you are communicating with your birth partner. Okay. This last one <laughs> kind of maybe goes along with that. Um, I know that like so many of us experience this, but nightmares. <laughs> these are like the weirdest, the, no explanation for it, right? Like we can say hormones or whatever else, like we don't necessarily know exactly what it is, but I would say fluctuating hormones, um, interruption of your sleep cycle, things like that. But we have these random dreams about 
the most random things and it can be so scary. And it's especially like a lot of us have dreams about our babies, right? Like you take your baby out of your stomach to look at him and you can't get him back in or, you know, like, I don't know, something starts coming out of your belly button or like I, anyways, I don't want to go over all the like crazy things that, that women and myself have dreamed because we don't need you to have any ideas, but there's like just these like weird dreams that you're like, what was that? And, and you know, pregnancy dreams are a very real thing. Um, back to like meditation, prayer, having a bedtime routine, um, what you were eating and not eating right before bed. So your body's not digesting. Like you can be in a, in a healthier state of like going to sleep unless you're dealing with that nausea and then you have a little quick snack, right? Um, therapy, that kind of stuff. But, and then just talking with, <laughs> with your husband or your, or your birth partner, helping you get through those things. I do think it's helpful to share those things with other women, um, especially other women who have been pregnant. I feel like they all have their stories and then you guys can share stories and kind of laugh about the weird things that it's just part of it. I know, um, with each subsequent pregnancy, like I still hated having these weird random dreams, but I was like, okay, like, I know, I know that the pregnancy hormones are on. We're probably going to experience some of this and it just is what it is. Um, but again, if you're feeling like, like these nightmares are not stopping, they're waking me up all the time. They're really dark, something like that. Make sure that you're reaching out to someone who can help you. The good news about 99% of everything that I am talking about is it goes away with pregnancy or with birth. So once you give birth to your baby, all of these aches and pains and weird things, heartburn, all of it disappears. Oh, it's so nice. So hopefully, hopefully if you're experiencing any of these, you not only found some really great solutions today, but you also feel a little bit of peace that it's not going to be forever and your body will be back to normal one day and it's all going to be worth it once you're holding that sweet baby. So, um, I hope you enjoyed today's episode and I will see you next week. If you loved what you heard today, the very best way to support this podcast and help other moms to find it is to leave a quick review. I read one at the beginning of the episodes and I would love for yours to be next. And if you're ready for even more pregnancy, birth, and postpartum goodness, come join me in the My Essential Birth course at myessentialbirth.com where I will hold your hand and walk you through pregnancy and birth step-by-step so you're totally prepared for a birth you'll love. See you next week.